name is Paul Coyer. I'm a research professor here at the Institute of World Politics. Uh, a lot of people that don't know who we are think that we're a think tank, although we do think, and we like to think we're smart. We're actually graduate school of foreign policy and national security. We have a, a bunch of different master's degrees, two-year master's and one-year certificates. Um, I've known Prince Ali for, I guess, about three years now. I had a friend of mine who'd done research for Special Operations Command and spent time in Afghanistan coming to give a talk. And uh, one of the audience members was this Afghan prince who knew more about Afghanistan than any of us will ever know. Uh, and I was so honored to have him there that I then hosted him a month or two later on his own and have had him here periodically and we do various meetings and we can say we're co-conspirators in some ways on um, trying to save Afghanistan. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a research professor here. I don't, I'm not actually a South Asia specialist. I do Russia, China, and how religion and culture shapes geopolitics. Uh, religion and culture obviously very much shape South Asia and Afghanistan. It's a very important issue. Uh, Prince Ali is, as you will see, uh, very, very entertaining to listen to. He has more stories, and I think most of them are actually true, than uh, anybody I've ever met. And a lot of them are in this new book. So unfortunately, as you probably some of you found out, we've sold out, which is a good problem to have. But we're trying to get more from politics and prose in the next hour or so. So by the time we're done, we may have some more left over uh, out there. So The Lost Kingdom, Memoir of an Afghan Prince. Um, I have not actually read it myself, but I suspect I know most of these stories yes. from talking to Prince Ali. Uh, and I can tell you that if they're anything like our personal conversations, you will not be able to put this down. Um, so we have plenty of time, so feel free if you have to go at a certain time to go, we're not gonna see over hours, but I told him to talk until about five, so a little under an hour, then we'll have about a half hour Q and A. I guarantee you, you'll have a lot of questions. So we'll, we'll use that time up. And then afterward, if any of you still have the time, and I do, and Prince Ali does, we can stick around here and just mill around informally and talk as well. And again, hopefully we'll have some books uh, coming soon. So um, Prince Ali, I think most of you probably have seen the bio. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the nice people here helpfully spelled out in phonetics how to say all these names, which uh, luckily I already know, so it's not an issue. But uh, his uh, uncle was the last king of Afghanistan. He was involved, uh, Prince Ali, in, in a lot of interesting things uh, from the history of Afghanistan, uh, tragic history and also some good things. Um, I don't know if we'll talk about it today, but one of the things he did was start a small chain of Austin Powers style discotheques in Kabul in 1970. Uh, when Kabul was a very boring place where Westerners were just at the wit's end because there was nothing to do, and he said, I'll give you something to do, and it was a great business opportunity, found a niche. And uh, from what you told me, right, you had MI6, Mossad, CIA, KGB, everybody hanging no, out. Every, every, <laughs> Nobody got hurt. No. But, uh, you know, girls in platform shoes. and yeah, We were not prejudiced. Flight. We were coming in all equally. Yeah, so he's a good Muslim, as you can tell. He's, he's, he, uh, he did that, and um, that got closed down. But he just led an interesting life. So uh, anyway, without further ado, I, I give you Prince Ali Sirash. Uh, welcome to IWP. It's a pleasure to stand here in front of you and talk to you about my favorite subject, which is Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, of course, uh, being my homeland. I'm the son of Afghanistan. But when I first came to the United States in 1960s to attend the University of Connecticut, nobody knew Afghanistan. And uh, the international uh, a student body uh, through a party at the International House to which I was invited and I was mingling around the people and a very beautiful girl came in and she introduced herself, I don't remember her name, but she was from a sorority called Kappa Kappa Gamma. And she asked me where I was from and I said I was from Afghanistan. I said, oh, that's very nice. So what part of the United States is that? <laughs> that, was very, that was very, very surprising for me and I, I, I didn't know how to answer her. Then another lady uh, came and she said, Afghanistan, oh yes, I have an Afghan. I said, oh, very nice, very nice. I said, I love my Afghan. And now that made me feel very good, you know, that this Afghan might be such a nice person. That she so this Afghan keeps me so warm in winter. Now I started blushing. Why is she telling me a real dark secret? Until she realized, she saw the look of surprise on my face. She said, do you know what I'm talking about? She said, no. She said, it's a shawl. I said, oh. <laughs> they call an Afghan. So the only the three things that we are known about: the Afghan blanket, 
this young lady who did not know uh, what part of Afghanistan, uh, in Afghanistan, what part of United States Afghanistan was, and the Afghan hound. Outside of that, nobody knew anything about Afghanistan. Today, everybody knows where Tora Bora is and who Osama bin Laden is, and where Afghanistan is, and where Afghanistan is becoming the longest war of the United States of America. War to us is nothing new, you know. Afghanistan being the uh, the belly button of Central Asia, with uh, unfortunately you don't have a map. I hold my hand because this is the way Afghanistan is. Right over here, the tip of my thumb is China. Next to it is Tajikistan. Next to that is Uzbekistan. Next to that is Turkmenistan. Then you have Iran, and all around here you have Pakistan. Afghanistan is surrounded by five Islamic uh, nations. But this was not the way Afghanistan was historically. Historically, Afghanistan was a very large country, and we had a way to the ocean. Afghanistan, uh, being in the center of San, you know, in the middle of Central Asia, we were the gateway for all the uh, invaders of the world. If we were to write a book on who's who of the invaders of the world, you would surely write on Afghanistan, from Tamerlane to Genghis Khan to uh, Alexander the Great. In fact, Afghanistan has never ever been conquered by anybody. Uh, they have come in, they have stayed, but they have lost. In fact, Alexander the Great laid siege to the gates of Kabul for six months and he could not conquer Afghanistan. So he diverted his way and he went into India, but a part of his uh, soldiers stayed behind in an area of Afghanistan, which is near Pakistan and the Pakistan of one border, which we call now Nuristan. The recent wars of Afghanistan started during the uh, reign of my forefathers. My great grandfather, nine generations uh, removed, uh, King Dost Muhammad Khan, established Afghanistan in 1827. And uh, the British at the time was in India, and they had great concern about the, China, the Russians coming through Afghanistan to go to the warm waters to invade India. So they always wanted to influence Afghanistan. So in, uh, in the 1800 and uh, the mid uh, 1830s, they invaded Afghanistan, replaced my great grandfather and my generations, and moved with another king, and they, uh, his name was uh, uh, Durrani. Uh, and uh, he, he was there for a short period of time because the people uh, immediately rebelled against the British. And under the uh, 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 directing direction or control of my grand uncle, Wazir Barhan, uh, war started in 1838, and from 1838 to 1842, we fought the British, and we defeated them. We chased them out of uh, Kabul, another 16,500 Indian uh, British soldiers and Indian sepoys, 248 women and children were taken as hostage. The rest of them were killed. Only one man made it alive to an area. Uh, city called Jalalabad, near where it is now Pakistan, and his name was Dr. Bryden. Afghanistan came back into our own hands. Then <clears throat> we continued, my family continued ruling Afghanistan until 1878, when the British again decided to invade Afghanistan. And at that time, my grand, great grandfather, uh, uh, Madhya Khan, was the king of Afghanistan. And uh, this was the Second Anglo-Afghan War, which was called the Battle of Maiwand. And this is the uh, in this battle, the British lost uh, shamefully because of, uh, they lost an entire regiment of thirty thousand troops uh, in, in the deserts of uh, an area near Kandahar called Maiwand. And uh, so we defeated the British a second time. The third time, when my grandfather was assassinated in nineteen nineteen. And uh, to this day, we are convinced that the British were behind it. Uh, my uncle, Amanullah, the second son, uh, actually the third son, but uh, uh, we can say my second because one of the other elder sons was not too well liked by the family. Uh, he uh, became the king of Afghanistan, and immediately at that time, as the first king of Afghanistan of an Af free Afghan uh, nation, he declared war against the British and also recognized the Bolshevik government of Russia. So as the first leader of a, of a native country, he recognized the, the Russian government. 
And then at the same time, he declared war against the British, and we went to the third Anglo-African war. Before these wars, even though the British were not in Afghanistan and we had defeated them, we were not allowed to have any control over our foreign policy. All our foreign policies were controlled by the British. We were only allowed to be involved within the uh, internal policy. <coughs> My great life, let me uh, see if I can get some pictures. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I'll come to that story later. Uh, this is my grandfather, and King Amanullah is the one to his left. He was a young man, 18 at the time, and to his right is uh, his oldest son, Inayatullah. They, they were all kings, but uh, after Amanullah abdicated, Inayatullah took over, but by that time the insurgents had uh, taken over the country. These are the young princesses from Afghanistan. This is Queen Suraya, uh, the wife of King Amanullah. And uh, she, uh, she was the one in 1921 when the Afghanistan Constitution was written. Uh, she put there the clause of uh, right, uh, uh, the, the rights of the Afghan women to be able to vote. So Afghanistan was the first country in Central and in that whole area. And in fact, uh, even Europe, at the time when the Afghan women got the right to vote in 1921, the European women didn't have any right to vote, and neither did I think the women in, in the United States. <laughs> anyway, Queen Soraya was well educated, spoke uh, several languages. She was young, and uh, she started the uh, freedom of the Afghan uh, freedom and women's freedom movement. Unfortunately, the rule of uh, uh, Amarullah did not last very long. When Amarullah defeated the British, uh, he immediately set up on a trip to Europe to introduce Afghanistan to different countries in the world. And uh, one of the places he went to first was England. And uh, I'm sorry, these pictures are not in order. So, oh yes. When he went to England, he was received by King George V. And as you can see, King George is not feeling very comfortable sitting next to my uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, he is a small nation that defeated, you know, the, the line of the world. At that time, the sun did not rise or set on the British Empire, but we defeated them. And uh, so, this is a welcoming group in, in London uh, to greet my uncle. Uh, well, this is a picture of Queen Soraya that uh, I showed you before. Uh, the British wanted, even though they were defeated in Afghanistan, they still wanted to have influence in Afghanistan. So they tried to convince my uncle not to receive any help from anybody else but from the British. And my uncle could not accept that. So he, when he went to Russia on his, on his trip back to Afghanistan, he accepted assistance from the Russians, and the British did not like that. And so before my uncle entered Afghanistan, they uh, paid a highway thief 50,000 pounds. His name was Machi uh, Sakhal, uh, the son of a water carrier, who started an insurgency against my uncle. And they used this photograph of a bare armed queen as, uh, uh, as a, a Muslim woman who had turned against the Islamic religion. And they distributed this over the villages in Afghanistan and started this insurgency. And that insurgency uh, forced my uncle to abdicate because my uncle did not want to stay in the country and fight his own people. But uh, he said that the blood of his people was more important to him than the throne of Afghanistan. If they wanted, to, if they did not like what he was doing, here is the throne, do with it as you please. And he left with his family, and he was deceived in Italy by King Emmanuel, and he spent the rest of his life in, in, in Italy, and also in, he died in Switzerland. Afghanistan, from 19, uh, in, uh, the, the rebels uh, ruled Afghanistan only for nine months. The British realized that uh, the people that they put in power, but they were nothing. They were uneducated, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Riffraff. Clubbians? Yeah. Uh, they, they were un totally uneducated. And so uh, the British uh, convinced my relatives, King Nadesha, with his brothers who were living in Paris at the time, to come to Afghanistan and take over the country. And with the help of the British, they entered Afghanistan and they took over. Afghanistan, uh, and but they took it in the name of King Amanullah because the people had realized their mistake and they wanted Amanullah back. So he came and he said, I want to 
yeah, I'm taking the throne back for Amarna. So the people supported him. And when he succeeded in dethroning the uh, rebel uh, thieves, uh, he proclaimed himself the king in 1930, uh, uh, end of 29. In 1933, while inspecting his school children, he was assassinated. And uh, in fact, he was assassinated by the son of a very a good friend of my uncle, his name was Muqam Nabi Khan Charhi. Muqam Nabi Charhi, in fact, his grandson is right here in the audience sitting back there, was, uh, had supported uh, my uncle uh, to the very end. And then when my uncle abdicated, he also left and he went to Turkey. But then he was asked, when the new king uh, took over, he asked him to come back. When he came back, he asked him to pay allegiance to him. He said no. That he will not pay allegiance to him, his allegiance was to Manla, so he was killed under the stock of the gun. And uh, so another shot took over. And three years later, the son of the servant of Ulam Siddiq, and during the uh, school inspection, the shot assassinated another shot, and his son Zaya Shah, who was at that time, I'm sorry, I'm going very fast, you know, I'm a fast train. Amtrak has got a lot of power right now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Zaya Shah became the king of Afghanistan in 1933. He was only 17, but in order to become the king, he had to be 18, so they gave him one year. You know, we, have, we easily give um, gifts like that. You know, like we have we have more generals in Afghanistan. You know, they have, they have not seen the, the, uh, the, the ground of the military. All of a sudden, they become generals, you know, general post and general this and you know, that. Doctorate, general, these are easy titles. In fact, you know, I should open up a university for giving you doctors and general titles. Uh, so, in any case, um, now that Zahir Shah became the king, but he was he was very young, so his three uncles ruled Afghanistan uh, until uh, 19, early 1950s. Uh, in early 1950s, uh, Daoud, the last president of Afghanistan, who got assassinated, became the prime minister. He was the first cousin of the king and also the brother-in-law of the king. And he was, uh, he became the prime minister of Afghanistan. Immediately he looked to the United States for assistance. The United States uh, sent uh, then Vice President Nixon to Afghanistan to see uh, what could be done. When Mr. Nixon arrived in Afghanistan with his wife Pat uh, and in Kabul, uh, like uh, Brazil, we have these favelas, you know, these houses that are built on the mountains. Uh, and uh, so Nixon went to the government and Pat was taken a tour of Kabul uh, at night and he, she saw all these lights and the next day she wanted to know where the high rise buildings are in Afghanistan. They said, we don't have high rises, you know, there's a house on the mountain. And when Mr. Nixon returned back to report to President Eisenhower uh, and he reported to the Congress of the United States that uh, the American taxpayers' money should not be wasted on a barbaric nation like Afghanistan. This is part of history. This is his exact statement to uh, the Congress and to President Eisenhower. That really ticked off Daoud. Daoud's other brother, his name was Daoud. So they decided to divide the power in two different ways. Daoud immediately went to Russia and requested help from Russia. And the Soviet Union was waiting for a chance like this, so immediately the first help that they gave us was all these second-hand military, Second World War military equipment, tanks, and you name it, you know, started pouring into Afghanistan. And uh, but Naim, on the other hand, was playing his hand towards the West. This East-West uh, uh, relationship continued to, to, uh, throughout uh, Daoud's uh, uh, term as, as the Prime Minister. In uh, 1963, the king decided that there was time for Afghanistan uh, to become a constitutional monarchy, but could not become a constitutional monarchy if his own family was there. So the, the constitution said uh, the relatives of the king could not hold any high positions within the government, and uh, it would be a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and uh, they elected a part of it. So I'm going very fast, you know, but you read the book, you get the details. In 19, uh, from 63 to 73, Afghanistan was in a beautiful, this is when I built, I was in the United States, I did my education at the University of Connecticut, and I came back to Afghanistan. I went to London, my sister was in London at the time, and uh, I was walking last night in London, I was walking and 
I was hungry and I said, let's eat something. So I saw a sign that said the 25th hour. And I liked that. I stuck in my head. I said, this is great. So when we were inside, I told my sister, I said, I think I'll open up a restaurant in Kabul called the 25th hour. So as soon as I arrived, I told some of your family members that I was going to open up a discotheque. And they all laughed at me. Discotheque in Kabul? Alcohol? Are you mad? I said, no, no, no. I said, here, I've spent years in the United States. I was going to the clubs and discotheques and over here. There's nothing to do. We are sitting in a restaurant drinking green tea on a Thursday night. Right? <laughs> Friday, Fridays, Fridays are Sabbath. It's a Thursday night. There are three men sitting over there, three cousins drinking tea. I said, this, 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 this will not do. So on the corner of a newspaper, I did a little drawing and I said, this is going to be my club. So the next day, I went around the city. I located uh, two shops. Brought to my cousin. I rented the shop within three months. Uh, that's how we have about two, two to three months. I had the most beautiful, well decorated uh, club in the region, not only in Afghanistan. Velvet walls and Chinese silk uh, couches. One bar outside serving only Coca Cola and so But there was a bar way in the back, you know, we served any alcohol we wanted. Uh, <clears throat> so, we started, and I started this movement at the same time. One night, this German guy comes to me and he says, uh, Would you like me to build you a dance floor? I said, I have a dance floor. He said, No, no, this is concrete. I'll make you a glass dance floor. I said, How much is this glass dance floor going to cost? He said, Nothing. I said, There's nothing for nothing. He said, How much do you want? He said, Just give me my lunch and my dinner. I will design this for you. So without doing any backup check, I said, okay, go ahead. So that's the same evening, we closed the club, dug the floor up, put the glass bricks in and lights, they had about 250 lights underneath the thing. And then a week later, we inaugurated the uh, dance floor, with 250 lights you know, shining underneath uh, in different patterns and the black light uh, shining up here. It was very funny when the first night when the, the girl, Afghan girls came in, they, all, they were very old, very well dressed, you know, black. Uh, outfit, you know, blouses and so on and so forth. As soon as I turned the black light on, all the bras underneath started shining. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of confusion. I'm sure that's not cross his mind. After after that, you know, they got used to it, so they dressed they, they dressed uh, properly. <laughs> but I, I never knew until I left Afghanistan why this German did what he did. Later on, I found out that he was an East German spy. And the manager that, that I had hired was a Frenchman, and he was a Chinese spy who was married to a relative of Mao Zedong. So I did not know about this. You know, all I was interested in was my club. You know, I had people like uh, Leon Lurie's come to my club. Uh, Hollywood people came in. In fact, the Emperor of Japan, who's now the Emperor at that time, he was Crown Prince. He and his wife were in my club. All the ambassadors, they were all there. And 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 you name it. You know, uh, the CIA, CIA, the FBI, the uh, 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 Mossad, uh, um, uh, the uh, Russia, Russia's. Uh, uh, What's his name? KGB. KGB. It was very funny when the KGB would come in immediately, two CIA members would walk in. And then from this side, the uh, MI6 was walking. I mean, I knew all of them. I mean, everybody knew, including top uh, drug dealers, you know. Uh, in fact, I, you will see in the book uh, that uh, I and the US Embassy asked for my help. And so I assigned somebody to follow these big drug dealers. You know, they were buying at that time hashish. And, uh, uh, to find out who they are and then report it to the embassy. I didn't want to give myself in there, but I had to assign somebody to do the work. So the club became a very, very popular place. Very popular. Eventually, uh, the coup of uh, 1973 occurred. And uh, uh, the coup of 73, my beautiful wife who's sitting in the crowd, uh, she uh, it was in Afghanistan when the coup occurred, and uh, it was uh, very funny. At uh, one o'clock in the morning, and there was uh, I, we heard the sound of gunfire going on, and uh, uh, I jumped out of bed and I went to the window. It was full moon, you know, and my garden was downstairs. So what's going on? I said, "Well, it's 
we heard the fire coming. My, my house was within the diplomatic community. And uh, so I grabbed hold of my gun and I ran downstairs. And my <coughs> cousin, who was a general in the military, his house was next door to mine. As I ran outside, I looked and he was standing over there with his military outfit on. So I ran to him. I said, Let's go. I said, Where are we going? I said, We're being attacked. Because there was rumor that the Palestinians were coming into Afghanistan. I said, let's go defend the country. I said, before I go anywhere else with you, would you mind putting some clothes on? I looked down, I was only in my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to get dressed. <laughs> so I had to run back, get dressed, come back. And at that time, a friend of mine from the university and his wife were visiting me. And so I lift them all and I went to see what was going on. And then when I realized that the crew was from a family member, Daoud, and it was not an outsider because there was a bloodless crew, only six people. So we, we sort of uh, we sort of calmed down. Fast forward, nineteen uh, that uh, during the during that uh, coup they closed all the clubs down because I think they wanted they didn't want people to walk around the streets at night. When they reopened the uh, club, uh, just full stories there. Um, I did not reopen the twenty five hour. By that time, I had established another restaurant, a supper club. I didn't have the Golden Lotus. Uh, and so the Golden Lotus was in full operation, and uh, we were doing very well there. And again, we had a live band and music and a sunken bar and the whole thing. Um, in 1978, uh, the situation in Afghanistan was getting very hairy. As the, the communists were beginning to make a move, and a communist member was assassinated. I'm sure he was assass assassinated because they wanted the communists to take over. Uh, it was evening of uh, April 27th, and my wife had just returned with our new second child to Kabul uh, about a month after. Uh, it was the, eve um, the uh, early morning of uh, April 27, 1978, that I get a phone call from my brother get yourself to the restaurant as soon as possible. I got in my car. I had the only Jaguar and the only NGTC in Afghanistan. So it was very, you know, no cars. So as I drove to the intersection, the police saw me and said, don't go that way, there's something going on, go through the back road. So I went through the back road to the restaurant. I see my brother and everybody is standing over there. And I said, what's going on? He said, look, it was a really uh, horrible, windy day. I said, what am I looking at? He said, look. So I looked and I saw the soldiers go here, you know, lying in these trenches, which we call Jewish, on the sides of the street. And I heard the sound of uh, cannon fire. Be being uh, trained in the mil Afghan military as a tank commander, I recognized the sound uh, being of tanks. So uh, anyway, to make a long story short, at that time, my cousin came in. We decided to go to our own homes. And uh, when I was dropping my cousin off, this jet, MI, uh, make, uh, whatever it was, this mech came shooting down. And I quickly turned the street, and my cousin ran towards, uh, you know, ran down the street, and this plane opened a fire, killing dozens of people. And my cousin got his uh, leg blown up in that situation. So I went home, I saw my wife, and I told her what the situation was. and. Uh, I had just built a, a swing set for my oldest daughter in the garden in the evening while she was putting the babies to sleep. And I went and I stood down in the swing and it was above my head. So I figured that if they come in, they will hang me from the swing. So I did not want my family to see me, my children see me hanging from my children's swing set. So I called the sir, my guard and I said, cut the swing set down below my neck. So that's what we did. And then the next morning, uh, Afghanistan fell in the hands of the communists. Uh, President Dawood and 19 members of the family, we are all the same family, were massacred inside the palace. The youngest, me, the youngest one being two years old. And then Dawood and his brother, his wife, his sons, um, uh, daughter in laws, their children, 19 of them were massacred by the communists, and the country fell in the hands of the communist regime. In 19, uh, uh, at that time when it fell, uh, I was informed that I was on the list of being uh, executed uh, by a member of the 
ministry of Nicodemus to get out of Afghanistan as fast as I could. I could not get out of Afghanistan because I did not have a regular passport. But I had, I had a false passport, which a friend of mine came and said, give me that and I'll get it stamped. So he took my passport and he took it to the Ministry of Interior and had it stamped and brought it back to me. And uh, then we started making plans on how to get out of Afghanistan. My wife, uh, the American ambassador, Ambassador Dutch, uh, bless his soul, may he rest in peace forever, uh, intervened on my wife's behalf to get her and the children out and use the American influence to influence uh, uh, the uh, communist government <coughs> to give her a visa. Amin was in charge at that time to get her out of Afghanistan, uh, but she would not go without me, even though she had permits to go. Uh, she would not leave me. So we decided that we leave together. So how do we get out? So my bodyguard contacted the Pakistani bus, and uh, we decided to leave by the bus. And at that time. Vest that uh, uh, I started talking that this is the vest that I was wearing, and uh, my hair was long and on, dirty jeans, and, and uh, we get on a bus with uh, 30 hippies. And uh, <laughs> we were, uh, she sat in the front with the two kids and my bodyguard, and I was in the back of the bus. And uh, I took a value of 10 to calm my nerves down. I told the hippies what I was doing. He said, so he can hand me a guitar. I said, what am I going to do with this? I said, Ray. I said, how am I going? Well, I don't know how to play. He said, don't worry about it. Just do what we do. So as we're going, you know, we come to a military checkpoint. The, the bus stops. The police get on board. They start strumming on the guitar. I start strumming on the guitar. They, they, <laughs> light, up their, they light up their hash pipes. You know, there's so much hash around me. And by the time I got to the border, I was totally stopped. <laughs> totally stopped. When I got to the border, um, my uh, bodyguard, uh, I was I was told, don't worry about it. Uh, the driver at the bus said, I, said, I take all the passports. You just get out of the bus, walk around. I'll take all the passports of the passengers. I'll get the stamp. I'll come back. And then you just slip back on the, board, on the bus and we leave. I said, okay. And when we got to the border and he went and he came back, he said, I'm sorry, they've changed their plans. They want to see each person individually with his passport. What am I going to do? So I decided to wait until about 60 or 70 percent of the passengers had gone to get their passport stamped. Then I slipped in. By the time I got to the guy, he, you know, I had my passport open like this. He had got into this habit, you know, boom, boom, boom. So I put the passport down. He headed and said, Thank you. And I walked back. As I'm going back towards the bus, my daughter sticks her head out of the bus, Daddy! Daddy! So I ran behind the bus. And uh, anyway, so to, to make a long story short, to cross the Afghan border into Pakistan, there's one chain, and then there was about 50 meters of no man's land, and then another chain. And there was this uh, mustache communist uh, uh, officer who was suspicious of me. And uh, when we got to the first chain, he stopped the bus and he boarded the bus. And he went directly uh, to my wife and took her passport to read it. And she had visa, so no problem. Then he started checking out the passport. And I was ready to say, okay, I give up, you know, take me. Three seats before he got to me, uh, a soldier boarded the bus and he said, sir, there's an important call for you from a cow. Uh, I said, I'm busy. He said, no, no, sir. They really want you. You must come. So the minute the, the officer left, the driver gunned the motor, and I closed my eyes, and I felt the front tires going over the chain, and then the back tires going over. It was, it was like a slow motion, you know. And, you know, you know. So we went through this, through this 50 meter uh, space, you know, then I saw. I felt the second that they go, the front tires go over the chain, and when the back tires went over the chain, everybody jumped up, you know, and we hugged and we kissed, and, you know, and congratulations and all that. And then the driver, all of a sudden, I felt very, very hungry. So as the driver was driving, there was a side road to the Chaihana tea house. I said, let's stop here and eat something. So we got off, and uh, I ordered eggs and naan. Uh, and, butter. 
and he brought me the eggs when I could not see the eggs. It was all black. I was wondering, how come the eggs in Pakistan are black? Until it got to me, and then you realize it was full of flies, you know, flying over it. <laughs> to this day, the taste of that food is very much alive in my mouth. So, <laughs> then anyway, there is the story you will, you will, you will read uh, in, in the book. But to make a long story short, during the time of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, um, I worked very closely with uh, the U.S. government, especially with uh, this is uh, President Reagan. In, um, in, in November of uh, uh, when he got the, the nomination for uh, the President of the United States Republic nomination, I sent him a letter requesting assistance for the Afghanistan to save Afghanistan from the jaws of the communists. It was a very, it was not a, it was a telegram, those days of no computer. So he sent me this letter, it's all signature. Um, and your um, generous words means a great deal to me, I welcome your uh, partnership in the cause. Uh, and he really did become our partner. A week after <coughs> he became the President of the United States, I received a call. Mr. Siraj, I said, yes. He said, I've been instructed by my government to see you. I said, which government? <laughs> he said, this government. I said, okay. And my wife was there, my cousin was there. I said, this guy wants to meet with me. So my cousin said, ah, this is a KGB, it makes sense because you've probably been talking about against the, 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 the communists. They're sending somebody to shoot you. So I told the guy, I said, uh, okay. I said, uh, what's your name? He said, I will introduce myself when I see you. I said, you know my name? He said, yes, I know your name. I said, you know what I look like? Yes, I do. I said, okay. He said, we're going to meet at exit 35 off of I-95 in Connecticut at McDonald's Park. So both my cousin and I, we put on our fog raincoats, you know, looking very distinctive, you know, like uh, undercover agents. And like I said, I'm going to be driving a red uh, Toyota. I said, see, he's a communist, he's driving a red car. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> you can't do anything, you know. Let us go. So when he came in, he drove up because when the McDonald's is the exit, you know, it comes out, you can see the cars coming in. So the car came in, as soon as he pulled in the driveway in the parking lot, we both went and I stood by his door and my cousin stood over there, make sure he couldn't get up. He said, uh, please ID ID please. So he pulls out his uh, thing and he shows me he was the uh, area uh, CIA uh, agent bank for, for the area. And uh, when I saw that, I said, okay, let's go to our house. So we came home and uh, I told my wife, I said, uh, uh, you stand, we, I, we lived there very close to my father. -in -law. I said, you stand over there. If anything goes wrong, you jump out and go and inform your father. So we sat down and he told him point blank. Right. He said, the government, they, President had asked him to talk to me what kind of American weapons could be sent to Afghanistan. I said, we do not need American weapons because we were trained on Russian weapons and we knew Russian weapons. Give us Russian equipment. He said, we don't have Russian equipment. Yes, I said, you do. Sadat of uh, Egypt was flushed <coughs> with uh, Russian equipment. At that time, the United States had started to help uh, Egypt with uh, American weapons. I said, I please have, you know, get the weapon from uh, Egypt and send it to Afghanistan. Charlie Wilson takes claim for it. He has got nothing to do with it. Whoever's with Charlie's book, I will stand to this day. I have, weapon, I have witnesses. One is sitting over here, others all over the place. Uh, had nothing to do with it. Uh, and then I have I gave him a whole long list. He came back and said, your referred request of weapons has been accepted. And he brought a list of 120 people of the communist members, please identify these people to us. So we did. And then he disappeared. I never heard from him for a month. I did not hear. Then I hear another account. This is your so heart picked up a voice. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> yes. We want you to go to the Sikorsky Airport in Bridgeport, sit at the coffee counter with your back towards the passengers, and somebody will come to talk to you. I said, OK. I said, can we not be someplace else? No, no, I said, okay. So I had a cousin who was trained in the military service in the 
U.S. and he was living nearby, nearby me. I said, you got to come with me. And he said in front of me, if you see somebody coming from behind with a knife, you tell me, where, do you go left or right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting over there and my friend uh, is uh, sitting across from me. And then I felt uh, somebody tapping on my shoulder and I turned around and looked. And a jolly green, green giant. I'm a big man, but this guy was bigger than me. And he had handlebar mustache, and I could hang myself on one of <laughs> <laughs> Really, like this. And he did not even introduce himself. He said, Follow me. I said, Where am I going? <laughs> he said, Upstairs. I said, Okay, but I have a friend over there, you know. He said, You can come too. So, <clears throat> so we follow him upstairs to the conference room, and this long table, and we're sitting down. He said, My government has told me to, for you to introduce somebody to us to go to the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan and find out what's going on over there and bring us a full report. I said, I will go. He said, no, 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 I cannot go. I said, why not? He said, because you're a member of the royal family, your face is easily recognizable, and we do not want to endanger you. So give us somebody else. He said, hey, my friend will go. So my friend said, what? Daddy, he said, why are you volunteering me? I said, well, every, every evening you come to my house, you look towards the sky and you cry for Afghanistan. Well, this is your chance to go do something. <laughs> uh, anyway, he went. And then shortly thereafter, he came back. I said, what happened? He said, well, when I went over there, they told me that nobody should know that I was working for the U.S. government. And I told them I could not be a spy. So they gave me a ticket to come back. I said, you fool. Why did you do something for the country? He said, I did. I introduced another man. I said, who did you introduce? This guy who eventually became the Minister of Defense of Afghanistan, his name is Ray Obama. When I saw my friend, I said, see, you live in the Minister of Defense. Have you followed? And, uh, anyway, so we, we fought a lot against, uh, I, I went to, I was in the halls of Congress trying to get Afghanistan, uh, you know, the US attention for Afghanistan. We did receive a lot of help from President Reagan. The reason, we lost three million of our citizens fighting this war. One and a half million on the battlefield and one and a half million, which I call as a migratory genocide, because millions of our people left the country, uh, country and went to the mountains of Pakistan and deserts and beyond, and a lot of them died on the way. We had in the beginning, before we received American help, we had nothing to fight with except our bodies and uh, hammers and uh, muzzle loaders, you know, from the First World War and so on and so forth. But when the uh, assistance came from the U.S., uh, and I was in the United States at that time, and I was invited to Groton, Connecticut, uh, to the Naval Academy to give a talk on Afghanistan. And at that time, the Russians had, they were using the helicopter MI-17 and MI-26, MI-24, and one helicopter would devastate an entire village, and we had no defense against it. So I was over there talking to these uh, naval uh, pilots about this. After I finished my talk, two uh, officers came to me, I don't even, even know, remember their names, they took me aside, they said, why don't you ask our government for stinger missiles? I said, what's a stinger missile? He said, the only thing that can uh, get down these uh, helicopters is a stinger. So then I started going to the halls of Congress uh, talking about stinger. Again, Charlie Wilson takes care for that, he had nothing to do with it. Three congressional members helped, Humphrey of New Hampshire, uh, Don Richter of Pennsylvania, and Charlie Wilson of Texas, they helped to get this through uh, the Congress. But uh, the idea of getting the thing was, and I don't want to take care of it, but you know, it's part of history that has to be known who did what, right or wrong. So that was what broke, uh, turned the tide against the Soviet uh, Red Army. And that is what uh, brought uh, the war to an end. But the war did not end for Afghanistan. The war ended for Russia. For Afghanistan, the war has been continuing since then. Because the communists continue to rule Afghanistan, <coughs> then the, us freedom fighters, like fools, instead of taking advantage of, 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 of the peace that was brought to Afghanistan, we started fighting among ourselves. And uh, then uh, after that, Osama bin Laden uh, appeared in Afghanistan uh, with his uh, 3,000 uh, troops supported by the Pakistani military, ISI, and the services intelligence. And uh, the killing started, the bloodshed started running. And there was, there was no peace in Afghanistan. No Afghan from the age of 40, this side, has seen one day of peace in Afghanistan. There's been nothing but 
more than they have. We have lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of our people. Today we are losing uh, at the rate of over 150, 200 people a day, which is not important. My main thrust is to what to do to bring peace to Afghanistan. Afghanistan's history has been, uh, we are 5,000 years old. Uh, we are, our tribes have defended our, our nation against the, the different invaders um, over the years, uh, including fighting the Soviet Red Army. But this time around, after Mr. Bush came to Afghanistan in 2001, to this day, I do not understand the reason why uh, they have to turn Afghanistan into a battle zone. Because when when the, when the Taliban and Al Qaeda were defeated, uh, in fact, the Taliban were such uh, uh, horrible fighters. In the middle of the city of Kabul, there are these uh, uh, tree, tall trees, and in order to hide from the uh, freedom fighters, they would climb the tree, and the freedom fighters would go through the black pigeons, you know, of the tree. So, in any case. After they were defeated, Afghanistan was at peace. But somehow, somebody made a decision that Afghanistan needed help from 47 nations of the world. For the first time in the history of the world, 47 nations came to a small little country in the middle of Central Asia to help it from what I don't know. The Russians were gone. The communists were gone. The, uh, the Taliban were gone. The Al Qaeda was gone. But for whatever reason, to this day, nobody's been able to answer me the question. Afghanistan has entered the longest war in its own history and in the history of the United States. You have so far lost 2,600 of your young soldiers, and you have got over 22,000 injured for life. You have spent a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. And I have been begging time of Mr. Bush throughout Mr. Obama's administration and even now. Do not take away our right to defend ourselves. We have defended ourselves throughout our history. Our tribes always united to fight a common enemy. Let us defend ourselves. Somehow <coughs> they, they did not, they did not uh, listen and they have not listened. And this thing is not going to end so quickly. Regardless of how many policies, unless they unless they change the uh, the U.S. changes its policy uh, towards Afghanistan and starts talking to the people as opposed to the selected governments that that, that have come to Afghanistan, uh, we will not we will not succeed. So my my because my time is running short, uh, my request is that wherever you go, whoever you talk to, and whoever wants to talk to me, I'm available. I this is I'm going on to my 48th year. Of my involvement for Afghanistan from 1978 to this day. And you would think that as a member of the royal family of Afghanistan with 250 years of history and 12 kings, that something would have rubbed off on me. Even if I was maybe a donkey on the street, you know, I would learn something from my family's history and from what's been going on. So why don't you come and ask me what to do, how to bring peace to Afghanistan? Why, why, why go to Pakistan? Why go to Qatar? Why go to Indonesia? They cannot tell you how to bring peace to Afghanistan. Only an Afghan can tell you how to bring peace to Afghanistan. And only those Afghans, the two gentlemen sitting in the back, they are, they, are, they are the history of Afghanistan. Their families are histories of Afghanistan. And, and, and yet and there's a, a young man uh, who started, there you are, uh, uh, Mustafa, uh, he started a uh, a movement in the United States here, here, right here in Virginia, to get the young generation, uh, Afghan generation, to recognize their history and recognize their past. You know, to work for the future. We have got the people, we have got the brains, but we need the help. Um, help us to help you, or you know, and that then we can help everybody. If you do not bring peace to Afghanistan today in the world in Central Asia. The only little light that's still flickering, flickering for the West is Afghanistan. Pakistan is gone, Iran is gone, uh, Libya, uh, Syria is gone, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, they're all in the, in the hands of, uh, of, of uh, Putin. 
The only light that is left for the West is Afghanistan. If this light goes off, the United States and the West will not have a square foot of land in Central Asia. Putin will take over all of it. Is that what we want? Is that what we fought for? No, no, that's not what.